This session is all about mastering video. First up is Mark Bosco from the Omni Group, and he's going to talk about his experience making video for apps. Thank you. Thank you. Do you guys know what this is? Yeah? It's a, it's a RCA test pattern from 1939, television test pattern. It was actually part of the, um, uh, the original uh, test pattern generator, the RCA TK1, that uh, it was also called a monoscope because it actually had, inside the box, there was a camera pointing at a small version of this carbon etched on an aluminum plate. It's crazy stuff. I, I just love that merging of technology and video. So, hi, <laughs> I'm Mark Bosco. Um, for the last six months, I've been the video producer at the Omni Group, who make Mac and iOS apps. Um, and before that, for about 18 years, I worked for these guys doing uh, broadcast video production and post. Uh, I'm also a little bit dabble in development. I did have one app in the App Store. It's not in the App Store right now, but <laughs> it was the uh, uh, Star Trek episode guide that uh, I built for my friends at the Post Atomic Horror podcast. Um, and I also run the Objective C account on Twitter and app.net. Um, and just for fun, a couple of years ago, we built this, uh, wrote and directed this entry in the uh, Your Amazon Ad Contest. <laughs> about making a video that's as good as your app. Um, really like anything else in making your app, it's all about sweating the details. Um, uh, this will be a rel relatively high level overview, but uh, I've got a bunch of little tech tidbits in here for those of you who are trying to tackle it yourself. So first thing you want to do is record your screencast. No. Um, Maybe you back up a little how to record your screencast. Uh, well, let's back up all the way to why do you want to make a video? <laughs> That's good. Um, probably for a promotion, right? Uh, to promote your app. Maybe you want to make a how to video. Uh, you know, the tutorial to teach your views or something. Uh, maybe you're running into a support issue and you want to make a video to show your users how to get around this particular issue, or, um, use the app in a, in a better way. Um, maybe you have another goal. The important thing is to actually have a goal for what the audience will take away from the video. And really, all of it comes back to promotion. Um, they all reflect on you and your company. And um, you know, even on a more technical uh, tutorial or support video, it can impress on your customers that you care about how they use the app and maybe they'll be more likely to recommend you to others. And uh, a lot of times, folks will watch the tutorials or the support videos before they even buy your app. So it's almost like a demo version of your app for them to get, see what it's actually gonna be like. So. You've heard this before, know your audience. Um, your app is totally awesome, I'm sure. Um, but without a user, it's nothing. So, and people on average really don't care about the tech. Um, they really care about what your app empowers them to do. So, you know, who is your audience? What problem does your app solve for them? What does it empower them to do? Knowing that is perhaps the best thing 
you can keep coming back to focus on when you're going through the rest of this process? Is it going toward that goal? So, how to record your screencast. Maybe we'll back up a little bit. Uh, maybe you should write a script. It's really important to write a script. Don't wing it. You need to know your entire path through the video. Otherwise, it'll feel disjointed and dashed off. Um, and when you're writing a script, good writing is rewriting and rewriting again. The goal isn't just to tell it, but to tell it in the most concise way and pithiest way possible. Um, you want it to be short and clear. Um, and, you know, you can spend a little bit more time going through with this tutorial or a, a support video, you know, to get into the, the technical bits that you need to clarify. Um, but it's still important to, to get the script down. Also, writing a script means less wasted time later, um, both in production, um, because you have a plan, <laughs> you're gonna have less floundering around later in the, the editing, um, but also for your viewers, you know, you're, you do have that plan, so it's gonna be shorter and more concise, and you're not gonna waste their time. So, um, when I say write a script, Probably a lot of you think of this kind of a script, which is for a motion picture. And uh, while that's, uh, you know, a way of describing uh, dialogue and actions that are going to happen, it's not really concise enough for what you want to do. It's, it's more something, a document to be interpreted by the director. If you actually know what you want as far as video and audio, what you really want is an AV script. Um, which has video on one side, audio on the other. Um, it's just a simple table format. So <coughs> you can do it in pages or Word or WordPerfect or whatever you're using these days. Um, but the important thing is that the, the visuals are locked to the audio on the right-hand side, the story that you're trying to tell. And that really will help you plan through the process. Um, I like to use Markdown to do it, and I've just written a little CSS style sheet, um, and then I'll be in the show notes later. But uh, I'm using BB Edit here to do a CSS preview of the Markdown, and you know you could use it in Marked or Ulysses or uh, whatever editor you want to use that with. Um, and it's just taking the uh, unordered list items and putting them to the left as video, and the paragraphs go to the right as audio. So let's, um, let's take a look at this video, actually, that the script is for. It was a support video that we did at Omni that was hosted by our support manager, Brian. Hi, I'm Brian, one of the support units here at Omni. I'll be taking you on a tour of the new settings on OmniFocus for iPhone. Options change which tasks you'll see when viewing an action list, so you can see the big picture or switch to laser focus. On OmniFocus, swipe down on a task list to reveal the secret bar at the top. Tap on View, and you'll see the list of options. In Projects, remaining is the default setting, which shows you everything that's left on your plate. Available shows your actions in the progress on right now. If the action is set to start sometime in the future, it's locked because it isn't the next action in the sequential project.
if you have any questions, send us an email or give us a call. We're here to help. So, that's obviously a little bit longer support video. We're trying to cram a lot of technical information in there, but hopefully presented in an entertaining way as well. Um, <coughs> so, let's go through the process that I take to make one of these. Um, Again, it's going to be relatively high level, but we'll get those tech tidbits in there for you soon. Um, first thing I'll do, if I have time, is to make an animatic. Um, essentially, I'm just, I'll record a rough version of the, uh, yeah, the first Scratch VO, um, the rough voice of the video. And uh, we'll take it into Final Cut Pro and uh, just take still screenshots of the, the app, just do simple transitions in Final Cut Pro, just cutting them against each other to make sure that things flow pretty well. Um, and once we're happy with that, finally record the screencast. <coughs> yes! <laughs> so, there are a few ways to do this. Uh, one is obviously running the app in the simulator and using the screen recording app like ScreenFlow. Um, which is awesome because it has built-in editing and tools to highlight things. You can do your whole video right in there if you really want to. Um, and even if you record it separately, like we do later, you could use ScreenFlow as your editing app for the entire video. Um, you don't have to use oh, Cut Pro. <laughs> um, but the, the problem there is not all of the features on the phone are available in the simulator. Um, so I really prefer to record the app actually running on the device when I can. Um, to do that, it would seem that the obvious option would be go out the HDMI port. Um, when you plug in the HDMI adapter. Um, but the video ends up looking like this. With it's scaled to a different size than the native size on the iOS device. And it's got all the black around it that you have to cut out and deal with if you're going to deal with the video. So I think there's actually a better solution. Um, there are a few apps that will let you AirPlay to your Mac. One of them is Air Server. Um, and there are two advantages that it gives us. One is that you can emulate a projector resolution, 1600 by 1200. So that means when you're AirPlaying your iPhone to it and it's 1136 pixels tall, you can actually get all of that in there. So you can get full retina resolution from the iPhone, AirPlay to your Mac, and you can record it. Handy little record button there. So, when you're recording, a uh, few tips. Go as, you know, just go slow. Make your movements as smooth as possible. It's easier to cut out pauses later or speed up smooth movements than it is to try and slow down a rushed presentation or frantic movements. Um, do retakes. Uh, if you screw up, go back, reset, and try it again. Um, there's no, you know, you can go do it as many times as you need. You're going to edit this. Uh, there's no need to rush through or try to do it all in one go as a perfect one single take. Yeah. Um, and when you're done, there's the option to save it in that ProRes codec, which switch that format, because normally it would say H.264, which is a highly compressed video format, and it doesn't give you as good quality as the ProRes does. So, <coughs> first thing uh, after recording the screencast, I'll prep this in After Effects. Um, which is an animation and compositing program um, lets you put multiple layers of video together and you know, make something together out of them. Um, I'll pre-composite this with the, the screen uh, and the iPhone frame around it and then a background. And uh, it's pretty huge, my comp. It doesn't have to be exactly that size or anything, but uh, the whole point is that we built it around the full res size retina display on the iPhone so that we have that detail available if we want to zoom in. And you really do want to zoom in. Um, 
when you're doing an action on the screen, you want to be able to focus on that so the users can follow what's going on. Um, and, uh, you know, <laughs> users probably aren't showing it on a screen this big at home, so <laughs> they need to be able to see it on their little devices. Um, you know, take your time, make sure the eye can follow the flow, what's going on, um, and keep it short if you can, because the audience attention spans for videos is really short, um, unless they're, you know, really focused on getting technical information. Um, so how to support videos can be a little bit longer. Um, and at the end of the recording, once we're sure that the, the words are the way we want them and everything's flowing well, then we'll go back and record the final voiceover again. And if you are recording your own audio, um, please do use a decent mic there. <laughs> Don't use the one built into your laptop. Um, you want to get something that's going to give you a nice clean audio quality and that's a, a Rode Podcaster. That's actually a really decent place to start if you're looking for kind of a, a starter good mic. So. Beyond that, there's um, when we record the screencast through uh, the Air Server app, um, obviously your finger isn't actually part of the screen. So we actually put in that cursor to animate and show where the finger is. The, um, it's super important to have that in there because it's you know not only showing what's happening on the screen, but it's it's anticipating what's happening. That's important for your viewer. Because if a button is just hit, something happens on the screen and it might, you know, the iPhone might animate off to something else before you even have a chance to realize what button it was that was being hit. So when you have that cursor that's leading toward that button being pressed and actually hitting it, then the viewer can more easily understand what's going on. So, if you can, it's really great to add live action to your video because people can envision themselves using the app a lot better if it's placed in an environment that they can identify with and even more so if there are people that they can identify with in there. So, again, knowing your audience and picking opportunities for live shots that fit with how they might actually use it. Um, there's a few techniques there. <coughs> Obviously, you can just shoot it. There's a real person using the real device. No trickery there. Um, but unfortunately, that usually ends up looking crummy because it's super hard to get the lighting balanced so that the screen actually looks decent. Um, not just the color, because usually the iPhone screen is, is a much bluer, cooler white than whatever lighting there might be or daylight. And certainly the lighting levels, getting those balanced. And even at its brightest, the iPhone can't outshine the sun. So probably need some special effects to fake it. So one way to do that is doing a chroma key. That's something we could do in After Effects Again, we take that green and pull it out, and you can replace the screen in there. Um, if you want to move around in the shot, though, we'll need to track where that screen is so we can make the new screen move the same way. Uh, and we do that with an app called Mocha, which is a planar tracker. There's a, actually, it's Mocha AE is this version that comes bundled with After Effects. Um, but we would use that for shots like this, where I mean, this is just a very simple shot, but it's moving through the screen, and we need to track and make sure that the new screen moves the same way. And we have pretty good luck with having this subtle grid in here in the, uh, with either green or blue screen. Um, so it's subtle enough that it still keys out, and we can uh, get cleanly get that new screen in there. But the grid uh, gives us a little bit more tracking information to actually get that movement correct.
the other technique is doing rotoscoping, which just means drawing on the frame. Um, it's derived from an old animation technique, but usually used for creating a mat, which would be you know cutting out a piece of the video. So we'd end up having you know his hand being able to be put above the new screencast that's going to be inserted in there. So like that's a shot that was from the uh, Martian Craft video for briefs, and uh, you know, this the original plate. Nothing on the screen and just uh, little tape markers for Rob to know where to tap the screen. <laughs> um, so then we go in, wrote out his hands and we cut it out so that there's three layers to the video. There's the original shot, this one, um, the new screencast and then his hands on top. So that's the three layers there. <laughs> And then that's the final shot again. So um, the advantage of inserting the screen is, you know, that it's it really helps the user understand what it will feel like to use the app in a real-world situation, and uh, you know, getting the the lighting levels right makes it look much better and more believable to the user. Um, and we can also edit it to make you know the timings exactly the way we want them to look. So when you're collaborating with your team, you want to get feedback from them. There's a couple of tips I have for that as well. Um, one is using Apple's compressor app, uh, which compresses video to a smaller file size um, to optimize it for the web and for other devices. But there's a bunch of presets um, that you, you have for you know Apple TV, iPad, all of that. You can make your own. I've got one called OmniCuts over there. Um, but you'll see in the corner of the video, there's those red numbers. Um, that's a generator that you can have, this time code generator. Um, and that burns that time code into the actual video frame. So whenever anybody's watching it on your team, they can give you feedback based on that because, you know, everybody has the same numbers. So it reduces a lot of confusion. And once you build a, a preset in Compressor, it also integrates with Final Cut Pro, so you can actually just export straight to that compressor setting. The other thing I might recommend is uh, whipster.com, which makes it even easier, because you upload a video to their website and all of your uh, team can go on there and actually just click straight on the beard, I mean, I mean uh, on the video frame. <laughs> and, uh, make a note right there. Uh, so it makes it super easy to, for everybody to be on the same page. As far as distribution, um, you know, Vimeo and YouTube make it super easy to upload. And you can embed stuff in your own site. Um, and also makes it easier for users to share your video, like on social services. Um, but if you just want to have it restricted to your own site, uh, you could use a framework like video.js. Um, but the cool thing about all three of those is they allow for captioning. Um, so you can, you can have close captioning as an accessibility feature for your deaf and hard of hearing users. Um, and you could also use it to add translations if you wanted to. Um, they all support the web VTT format, the video text track format um, that's put out the, by the W3C. Um, and, but the unfortunate thing is that the state of uh, subtitle and caption editors is pretty terrible <laughs> across the board, Mac, Windows, whatever. Um, the least of several evils is this app called Jubbler, and that is their icon. Um, <laughs> it's this Java monstrosity that's pretty terrible, but at least it's usable um, to some degree. So these are, you know, there's a lot of advanced techniques here, so you may not be comfortable with doing it yourself, and you may want some help. That's okay. 
Um, there are tons of video production companies out there, and you don't have to stick to ones that say, we do app videos on their web page. Um, you know, there's lots of reputable companies, and you just vet them like you would any other contractor. And feel free to use anything here to you know, start a discussion with them. Um, but the most important thing that you can do is have a good idea of who your audience is and the message that you want to convey. If you have a solid grasp of that, um, you're ahead of an awful lot of small businesses who just want a video and not quite sure why they want the video or, or what the, their expected outcome is. So, um, so that's how I make videos. If you want to hear me talk about how other people make motion pictures, uh, that's my podcast on the right. Um, the show notes will be at bit.ly slash Final Cut Pros, and you do need to capitalize it like that or the link won't work, which is kind of annoying, but be aware of that. And if you want to chat, that's my contact info there. Thanks. So next up is Bob McCune, and he's going to dig into some of the details of using AV Foundation. There we go. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Bob McCune, and I'm very happy to be here talking to you today about one of my favorite topics, and that's working with video on iOS. I wanted to show you guys a photo. I'm sure some of you have probably seen this. This is a shot from Vatican Square um, in 2005 at the announcement of Pope Benedict and then in 2013 uh, at the announcement of uh, Pope Francis. Can anyone spot the difference in, in here? You know, clearly a lot's changed and really, you know, the real timeline is actually much shorter than, than that. But what's happened during that? Well, this happened and this happened. And of course, all of these happened. So we've got this amazing media platform and all, and all of these incredible apps that have been built on top of it that have really fundamentally changed the way that we think about and work with video. Uh, the way we create and consume and share video has dramatically changed. Video is not something that's simply relegated to our living rooms. Um, it's ubiquitous. It's always in our pocket. We can pull out our camera. We can take high definition video shots, edit it, add real time video effects, and then publish that up to the web all in a few taps of a button. But the technology on iOS that's driving all of this is a framework called, whoops, shoot. It's a framework called AV Foundation. And AV Foundation is Apple's uh, Objective-C framework for handling advanced media processing. So incredibly high performance, uh, deeply multi-threaded all the way up the stack. You do get hardware acceleration automatically, no additional work from the developer's perspective to uh, do that. So that's how we're able to get this great performance on these relatively low powered devices. The framework's been available since um, iOS 4, at least in its current form. Some of the early audio classes were actually in iOS 2 and iOS 3. But then in iOS 4, it really exploded into the form that it has today with a really broad set of capabilities. And since that time, we've seen significant additions. Each new version of the OS uh, comes out with some great new features. And iOS 6 and 7, in particular, added some really great new capabilities. But this is de definitely Apple's focus for media apps on both iOS and Mac. So if media matters to your, you and your applications, this should be an important focus for you as well. I just want to show a quick survey of kind of the iOS uh, media landscape. We really have a lot of great options at our disposal. So we've got very high level options, things you'll find directly within UI Kit itself, such as UI Image Picker Controller, which allows you to capture both still and video. Uh, the Media Player Framework provides MP Movie Player Controller, which is a really easy way of getting basic video playback in your application. 
The assets library allows the user, or allows you as a developer to interact with the user's photo library. So these are all really great, high-level, easy-to-use solutions. And if you're just thinking about introducing media capabilities in your app, definitely take a look at these, because for a lot of applications, these might be the perfect fit. Now, at the other end of the extreme, we've got very low-level frameworks, things like Core Audio, which we talked about the other day. We've got some what I consider pipeline frameworks, like Core Media and Core Video. Um, but these are generally lower-level C frameworks, um, very high performance, very powerful, but also quite complex and can take a while to learn to use. And then sitting in between there is AV Foundation. So this really strikes a nice balance of the power and performance you have with these lower level frameworks, but in a higher level, more productive Objective-C API. And because of where it's positioned, it too, you know, it's very common to work with these lower level frameworks in an AV Foundation app. And additionally, you might work with these higher level frameworks as well. Now, the framework's got a lot of capabilities. We're going to kind of just take a quick look at a couple of them. But before we do that, I want to introduce you to a couple of really important classes. Uh, the first is called AV Asset. Most of the framework is really built around this class uh, called AV Asset. But this provides you with an abstract representation of a media resource. And it abstracts away two really important pieces of data about that resource. One, it abstracts away the file format, or more accurately, the container format. So whether you're working with a QuickTime movie or an MPEG-4 video file or even an MP3, to you and to the rest of the framework, it's just an asset. The other thing is the location. When we create assets, we typically initialize these with a URL. And this is commonly a local bundle URL or it could be something, a URL you retrieve from the photos library. But this could additionally be a remote HTTP server URL. So we could either have a progressively downloaded asset, or this could be something served up by HTTP live streaming. And those details are really hidden away from you. You just initialize it. The framework does the heavy lifting to make sure you get your media in the most efficient format as you possibly can. And um, you know, it, it can notify you when it's ready to be acted upon. Now, closely related to AV Asset is this class called AV Asset Track. The AV Asset itself is not the media. It's really just a container for that media. Instead, it's composed of one or more uh, what are called AV Asset Tracks. And these model the individual media streams within that, that uh, asset. So we download a song off the iTunes store. You know, those things will typically have a single stereo or mono audio track. We're working with video files. We'll typically have a video track and a audio track in there. But as we'll see as we go along, we can really create uh, assets of our own that have as many tracks as we might need. All right. So let's talk about media playback. In a playback scenario, the main class in this case is this class called AV Player. And AV Player provides a controller object for managing playback. This isn't a controller in the MVC sense, but just a generic controller to manage the timing uh, of that playback. So it provides basic transport capabilities, such as play, pause, ability to seek the time so you can scrub through your medium. It also provides a, an important property called status. Whenever we feed media into an a AV player, it takes a few you know, a milliseconds, really, just to prime its pipeline. So we need to observe, observe the status property using key value observing, and then wait for us to tell it when it's ready to play. Then we can finally act on that medium. Now, KVO works well for general state observations, but it's not really, uh, it doesn't provide us the fine grained resolution that we need for real tight timing information. So there are some specialized time observations you can do. There's a per periodic time observer. This allows you to be notified at regular periodic intervals. Uh, most common use for this probably is if you're implementing a scrubber control. And as playback continues on, you want to be notified so you can progressively update the status of that control. And there's also a more specialized one called a boundary time observer. And this allows you to mark special, just arbitrary boundary points within a piece of media and say, when these things are traversed, let me know. So maybe you want to synchronize that with some other behavior in your application or animate something across the screen when that time is traversed. Now, our AV asset and AV asset track, if you look at the APIs for the API docs for them, we'll see things like duration. We'll see, you know, we can find out if it's exportable or playable. 
but we won't see our things related to timing. So we won't see something like its current time or the ability to seek to a particular location within that asset. And that's because this only models the static aspect of a media resource. Meaning that on their own, they're really unsuitable for playback. So whenever we want to play an asset, we need to construct their dy dynamic counterparts that we have in this class called AV player item and AV player item track. And these do then carry that presentation state, and these are ultimately we what we feed into an AV player. So let's just see this visually and get a better sense for how this fits together. So we've got our AV asset and its associated tracks. We construct an AV player item and its player item tracks. And finally, we feed those things into the player. And you know we're observing that status property, and when it tells us it's ready to play, we can call the play method. And if this video had audio content in it, we would start hearing that immediately coming out of our speakers. But as this is a non-visual component, we don't have any place to render this on screen. So we actually need to introduce one additional component. And that class is called AV Player Layer. And this is a core animation layer subclass that essentially acts as a rendering surface for our video content. It doesn't provide any playback controls or uh, any transport behavior on its own. That's entirely up to us, which is nice because it doesn't dictate how you go about uh, playing back your media. But like any other core animation layer, we can make this you know, the backing layer for a view or manually s stick this into the layer subtree. And as soon as we do, then we'll start seeing that video content rendered on screen. Oops. All right. So let's just take a quick look at a demo app. I don't seem to have audio coming out of here. That's because I've muted my audio. All right, what am I doing wrong to get this on the screen? Ah, there we go. Let's try that. So let me shrink this down just a touch. It's already at. Well, we can't quite see the full thing like I'd like, but. So over on the left, we've got uh, some various assets. So we've got some video clips. We've also got some audio clips. So when the application starts up, I initialize these assets and then build this little media picker section of the app. And there's some nice facilities for extracting images out of those video frames uh, so we can build a little more meaningful presentation for our clips. But I can preview these clips and So as I'm doing this, this material. so as I'm as I'm doing this, this material heats up. that asset is being taken and converted into a player item. That player item is then being passed over to this player view controller. So what you're seeing here is the AV player layer, and sitting behind the scenes is a player um, uh, AV player instance. We can also preview our, our audio assets. Some voiceovers. You and I have the courage to say to our enemies, there is a price we will not pay. There is a point beyond which they must not advance. So both um, you know, audio and video assets can be played by the same player uh, controller. So if you're just getting started with the AV Foundation, I think this is a good place to start. All right, we'll quickly look, look at composing media. Now, AV Asset has a concrete subclass called AV Composition. And this purpose is to allow us to compose asset segments uh, in some sort of temporal, temporal arrangement or compose these things on a, a timeline. So if I've got three different clips, I've got uh, the Golden Gate and Fisherman's Wharf and the Tea Gardens, 
So I'd like to grab that middle section from the Golden Gate Bridge and maybe the end clip from uh, Fisherman's Wharf in the front part of the Tea Garden. I can take all those things, take those individual pieces of media I'm interested in, compose those all together into an entirely new asset. And the same capability that allows me to extract little chunks also provides me the ability to trim those clips, rearrange those clips in any kind of arrangement that I might want. So let's take a look at how this works. So we start by creating a new composition. We'll specifically use its mutable subclass called AV Mutable Composition. This provides us a container object where we can insert tracks and content into. So we'll start by creating a video track, and this lays down a kind of an empty track within our composition that will allow us to insert various video clips into it. We'll do the same thing for video, or for audio, I mean. So with those laid down, then we can start actually reading those existing assets, extracting the little chunks of data that we want out of there, and insert them into their, our composition. So we want to grab seconds 10 through 30 of our Golden Gate clip. We can do that. And maybe we'll grab 20 through 30 out of the Fisherman's Wharf clip and then put that into that video track as well. And um, you know, we'll grab some audio content out of our iTunes library, maybe that makes a nice soundtrack for this. And we can insert that whole region into our composition track. And at this point in time, this is a fully formed asset. So just like we did with our other assets we showed in the media picker, we can take this thing and we can play it, we can export it, do all these cool things you can do. So let's switch back to the app. Let me see if I can just possibly shrink this down a little bit better. Yes. Fifty percent. All right. So we've got our different video clips, and we can drop these into our timeline below. So I'll grab that one, and I'll grab that one. I can hit the play button. Now you notice there's no audio playing back, and that's because I'm only extracting the video clips out of that those video files. But I can also take those things and. You know, I can trim those down, and maybe I'd like to move that to the beginning, make, make that the first clip. So we've changed the order of those. But we can also build up more elaborate compositions, too. So maybe I'll, I'll take this clip, and we'll add some additional content in there. And I think it was Rob who pointed out the other day that if you're looking at video without audio, it's kind of anemic and lifeless. So we'd probably like to add some video or some audio content in there as well. So I'll add a, an audio track and a, a voiceover track. Let's just take a listen to that. Again, get a good sense for what we're doing here. I know we're running a little bit low on time, so I'll probably just demo the remaining things I was going to talk about today. But one thing that we can do is, you know, with the audio, audio tracks that we have in here, you know, as soon as the video comes in, the audio immediately comes blaring in as well. We get to the end, it drops off very abruptly. Both transitions are a little bit jarring. It would be nice if we could fade that audio in and then fade it out at the end. And probably the bigger problem is with our voiceover tracks. And so music tracks playing so loudly, it's completely masking the voiceover, so you can't hear it. So we like to use a technique called ducking, where immediately prior to that coming in, we ramp down the volume of our audio tra or of our music track, hold it steady at that for the duration of that voiceover, and then when it's done, ramp it back up. And there's facilities, uh, specifically a class called AV Audio Mix, and AV Audio Mix input parameters are two classes that enable us to do that. So if I turn on fades and ducking, uh, I'm drawing a little uh, uh, volume curve here. So you can see the effect we should have. So I've turned that on. I should now hear the audio fade in and out 
more appropriately. Oops. <laughs> gradually fade out. So, um, you know, we potentially could drop that audio volume down a little lower if we wanted to, but we can make those kind of tweaks real easily. The other thing we can do is we can add overlays. So Mark is talking about doing things like After Effects. Well, we can add those kind of things in here as well. So I've added some animations in here. And the way we do that is actually through the use of core animation, once again. Core animation is a natural fit in a lot of ways. It's very high performance. Of course, the video we're seeing on screen is already rendered in core animation. And animations are inherently time-based, so they do fit in well. The one thing that is a little weird with using core animation is that it's really just overlaid on our presentation, or overlaid as kind of an additional track in our export. It's not actually part of our composition. Now, I'm depicting it that way because I think it's a more natural way of thinking about it. That's not technically what's happening. So it can be a little weird to get used to using this. But when we do this, we get this kind of <laughs> create animated title sequences, um, you know, credits, even doing simple things like adding a watermark or something to your video is very possible to do. And then the one last thing is all of our clips that we have arranged in our video timeline um, just have straight cuts in between them. But we've got these big scene changes. Maybe we'd like to add some transitions. Well, we can do that as well. So I'll use primarily some cross dissolves but just to kind of point it out in between these two clips. Maybe we'll do a push transition. Let's we'll see how all that fits together. <laughs> Lots of cool things you can do with AV Foundation. And there's some great new features that are added in both iOS 6 and 7 that allow you to do even more advanced things. A great new feature in iOS 7 is the ability to create your own video compositor. Uh, the ability to create transitions has always existed um, in AV Foundation, but you did have some limits. These kind of bread and butter transitions like pushes and um, dissolves and things were certainly accomplished, easy, to, easy to accomplish but you really couldn't go much beyond that. Now you can fully plug yourself into that rendering pipeline, the compositing pipeline, so that you know, typically through the use of OpenGL, you could do whatever kind of crazy video effects or transitions you might want. All right, so I will just, uh, just skip to the very end of this. I'll pull up some resources for you. So the slides themselves are already up on speaker deck, so there's a, a bunch of additional content in there you can take a look at. Uh, the full source code for that app that I was demoing is available on GitHub. It's up there right now. So you can check that out if you want to get into the details of how that was done. I am working on a new book called Learning AV, AV Foundation, where I go into great detail on all of these topics and a whole bunch of other AV Foundation topics. The book is still in development, but there are some of the early chapters of the book are available on Safari Books Online, so if you're interested in that, definitely check it out. There's some contact information for me, so thanks very much. So the next session is starting at 11.30. I think we might, if anyone has a quick question, we could take that over there. You might be the only question, and then we'll take a quick break. Uh, yeah, this is for Mark. Uh, I noticed that like, Apple has apparently very severe guidelines for portraying an iPhone in, in marketing materials. Uh, have you had to deal with that? Um, 
mostly we use a third party representation of the iPhone that they don't control. Um, I mean, they have their, the ones that you can download straight from their press site. Um, but as long as you're not... My, no, my understanding is like that if you want to photograph an iPhone in a, in a marketing material that, that you need their, their approval. That is not your yeah. understanding. Yeah, no, that okay. it is. Yeah, you're right. Um, but sometimes they'll let you get away with it, and <laughs> sometimes they won't. Um, they haven't had any problem with ours yet. So. Okay, cool. Thanks. Yeah. Maybe one other question, if anyone has a quick one. Anyone? Okay. Well, uh, let's take a five-minute break then, and the next session is starting at 11.30. Thanks.